Well, g'day and welcome to the channel. In today's video, I'm gonna be comparing the Sony A9 Mark II and the Tamron 150 to 500 to the Canon R6 and the Canon RF 100 to 500. I'm a bird photographer, I've used both kits in the field and I wanna share with you how they compare. Let me start by just saying that I am a Canon user. I've used Canon for over 10 years and this was my first time using the Sony. So I'm gonna be probably a little bit biased towards the Canon, but I'm gonna try and be as open and honest as I can and try and be impartial. So if you're new to the channel, I just take photos of birds out in the field. I'm not gonna be testing these in a lab. I'm not a technical expert. I just love taking photos and I wanna share those photos with you. So how's this comparison gonna work? Well, I'm gonna talk about the specs of both cameras and lenses. I'm going to cover the main things that are important to us as bird photographers. So I put out a poll to my subscribers and thank you to all those that participated in that. And on the screen you can see what you believed was the most important features. All right, let's quickly compare the specs of both kits. First, let's have a look at the cameras. And on the screen I've put on probably the most important features of a camera. And you can see them listed side by side. I was actually pretty surprised at just how evenly matched they were. The R6 kind of competes or matches the Sony in just about every regard, except for maybe the megapixels where the Sony has an extra four and it does have a stack sensor. But the Canon does have Animal Eye AF with birds. I believe only the A1 on Sony currently has that feature. So a definitely an advantage there. But the other big difference there is you'll notice the cost. The Canon R6 retails for I think about two and a half thousand US, whereas this is about four and a half thousand US. So I'll be interested to see whether this justifies that massive price increase over the Canon. But if we look at everything else, it's very similar. The FPS, the, the weight, the buffer, autofocus points, ISO, IBIS, viewfinder, all these things are almost identical. All right, let's have a chat about the lenses. So the Canon, as you can see on the screen, is a lot more expensive than the Tamron. I think the Canon retails around 2,700 US and around 4,600 Australian. So it's a very expensive lens for a zoom lens, whereas the Tamron's about 1,400 US and I think just over 2,000 Australian. So this one is almost half the price of this one. Is this one twice as good? Well, we'll have to find out. So why is the Canon so expensive? Well, it is an L series lens, so it's Canon's very best. It's got the, the highest image quality, the highest sharpness, and it's just a beautiful lens. Now, the main advantage is it's just the weight. So the Canon is way lighter than the Tamron. The Canon is around 1.3 kilos. It's, I can't emphasize how amazing it is to have such a light lens. You can handhold this all day without an issue whatsoever. It's really good for shooting video and just wandering around without having to use a tripod. The Tamron on the other hand is around two kilos with the tripod collar. It's not heavy, heavy, but it's about the same weight as the 150 to 600. And you know, I can handhold this without an issue, but I can feel the weight difference between the two kits, that's for sure. Uh, the Canon also has a much better minimum focus distance. It's around a meter, I think, roughly. And I think the Tamron's around 1.8. That just means you can get a lot closer to the subject with the Canon. Alrighty, so obviously they're both zoom lenses. The Canon starts at 100 and it goes out to 500. You turn it anti-clockwise. Uh, there's no real way to lock the focal range on this. You can turn the zoom ring to smooth or tight. Tight just means it's a little bit harder to turn. Uh, the Tamron, in comparison, this is 150 to 500. Uh, you turn it clockwise um, as opposed to the Canon and you can lock this in place by just simply pulling the zoom ring forward. So it's locked now, I can't turn it, turn it, lock. So both lenses are very versatile, enabling you to take photos of all sorts of things, wildlife, birds, butterflies, and that's a real advantage. Now in regards to the maximum focal length, obviously it's 500 millimeters. However, the Canon system can take converters. So the Canon can take a 1.4 and a two times. So it would make the lens very slow, but you could potentially get a thousand millimeters. On the other hand, I don't think you can put teleconverters onto the Tamron. I could be wrong and just check for this, but I don't think you can, meaning 500 millimeters is your maximum. So in regards to the price of both kits, it's eye-watering, it's very expensive. So combined, I think the Tamron and the Sony go for about 5,900 US, and I think this system's around 5,200, so around 700 US cheaper. In Australian terms, it's very expensive, almost nine grand, just over eight grand. So it's a lot of change for a zoom lens, and you'd wanna hope that it takes beautiful shots at that sort of price. Very quickly, when we talk about 500 millimeters, this is obviously fully extended 500 millimeters. This is the Canon 500 F4, so a slight difference. Obviously, this is a lot faster at F4, 
but you can see side by side um, what a difference that slower aperture of 7.1 makes. So the most important feature in the pole was the autofocus and that's fair enough you know if we can't focus on the bird we're not going to get good shots and I can confirm that both kits were exceptional. They were the best I've ever used in focusing on the bird and getting consistently sharp photos. So the Canon actually features the amazing Auto Eye AF and this works extremely well on birds. You can see here on this woolly wagtail once you get it onto the eye it just tracks the bird as the bird moves as your camera moves the focus point stays on the eye and I'm extremely confident when that blue focus box is on the eye that the bird is going to be in focus it's very rare for it to jump or miss focus when it's on the eye of course it can get distracted it's not foolproof occasionally it will jump onto a branch or onto a rock or something else and then I use traditional AF so I use dual back button focus on the Canon one of them is traditional just a, a little focus point that I can place over the bird um, and once it's got the bird I can then activate auto IAF and it just follows it around now the Sony has an animal IAF but it doesn't really work for birds I believe only the A1 has this feature so on the Sony you're not going to get that amazing tracking ability like you do on the Canon however the Sony does have a number of different focusing features so it has zone wide spot tracking it's got a variety of different focusing and look I tried them all and had different various success with e each of them I believe the zone is best for birds in flight or moving birds because of these birds I was tracking were sort of stationary and only moving around slightly I found that the zone actually got confused quite a bit of where it would lock onto a, a rock or something else and I ended up more using the spot AF and the tracking and those combination gave me more uh, accuracy in um, locking onto the subject than the zone did. Maybe it's user error, I'm not sure, but look, when I was using the zone, I just wasn't getting as many sharp shots as I was when I was using spot or tracking. So you can see here we had a willy wagtail on a branch, and if I focused on the she oak behind it, the zone AF couldn't pick up the bird. It just got confused, and even the tracking struggled. It wasn't until I put on the spot AF and put it directly over the bird and activate it that the camera could detect the bird. So it's just something to be aware of. I'm sure the Sony users in the comments can tell me what I did wrong or what you're most comfortable doing. You can see in this comparison shot on these woolly wagtails, the cannon's locked onto the eye, the bird is nice and sharp, whereas on the uh, Sony system, it's actually ended up locking onto the rock just in front of the bird, so the bird is slightly soft, and that is a bit of a shame. Now I have to give some credit here to the Tamron lens, it actually performed very well, it was quick to focus, I didn't notice a huge difference between the two in terms of focusing speed, so the Tamron didn't have any of the focus jumping that I suffered on the 150-600, to if the camera locked onto the subject it was sharp, unless there was some motion blur, you're very rarely going to get the focus jumping um, through the lens. All right, the second and most important feature was image quality and sharpness, and that's fair enough, you know, we all want the highest quality images possible and the sharpest images. It is worth noting though that I believe all modern cameras can take nice shots and there's a lot more to it than just the camera and the lens. You can check out my video all about image quality where I explain everything that goes into creating a sharp photo and you can check out the detail in this willy wagtail shot. The sharpness, the detail, just everything about it is beautiful and when you zoom in you get the detail just stays there, very low noise. Could you guess which system this was taken with? Well, this was actually taken with the Sony system. Let's have a look at two comparisons. On the screen at the moment, we've got a woolly wagtail, a nice, glorious, beautiful morning light, and we've also got a scarlet robin, again, taken in very similar light in a similar location. Can you tell which photo was taken with which kit? The woolly wagtail was taken with the Sony, and the scarlet robin was taken with the Canon. All right, another comparison. These birds happen to land on the same perch. We've got as a woolly wagtail, and the second shot we have is the Scarlet Robin. Again, which camera system do you think took each image? The image of the Willy Wagtail was taken with the Canon system, and the Scarlet Robin was taken with the Sony system. I believe it would be very difficult to tell which photo is taken with which kit. Here's another shot I really liked from the session, was this superb fairy wren male. It sort of jumped up onto the top of this bush, and it's giving us an over-the-shoulder sort of a pose. And believe it or not, this was a really big crop. I think this is only about 30% of the original file, so it's about an 8 megapixel image. So which system was this taken with? Well, this was actually taken with the Sony and the Tamron. 
So again, we could crop heavily. The Tamron and that Sony have allowed us to have a beautiful image that's only eight megapixels in size, which should give you some confidence that you're gonna be able to crop these images fairly well and still retain pretty good detail. So I'll go into high ISO later, but I just wanted to share this shot of a Willy Wagtail just to show you how good these cameras are. This shot was taken in sort of low overcast light at an ISO of 3200, which has traditionally been pretty high, but have a look at it. There's no noise reduction whatsoever applied to this image. And the noise is, it's there, but it's not really degrading the image whatsoever. So this image was actually taken with the Canon R6. And lastly, probably my favorite shot from all the testing I did was this shot of a superb fairy wren. This little male eclipse means it's a non-breeding plumage. It's singing its heart out on top of this rock. Got this photo and I really, really like it. This, this shot was taken with the Sony and the Tamron. You might be wondering if I took any comparison shots, and yes, I did. I got Aussie the Owl out. How I actually tested it was similar to how I would shoot in the real world. I've actually put Aussie on, on a rock, and I've used the lenses handheld. So I've taken a burst of images, handheld, and then I've just picked the sharpest images, because that reflects to me how you'd shoot in the real world. So the first comparison is taken at ISO 400 and F10, which should be a very high level of sharpness and detail. Um, you can see both images are very good, but I think the Canon has a slight edge in sharpness. Now the Sony file is a little bit bigger because you've got four more megapixels. And you know, we can adjust the size of the Sony to match the Canon to see if there's any difference. And again, you have to pixel peep to notice anything. So these first shots were taken at five meters distance. All right, so I often get asked to test from a bit further away. So I've gone to around 14 or 15 meters and taken a couple of shots. And we can see on the screen, I've actually shot them wide open. So 6.7 on the Tamron, 7.1 on the Canon, because traditionally lenses aren't their sharpest wide open. So this is a good test just to see how good these lenses are. And as we can see, the Canon does have a slight advantage, um, but the Tamron has, again, has performed well. So the last comparison shot is one of a Willy Wagtail that I managed to photograph on the same perch with both kits. It was taken at a real high ISO of 12,800. Can you have a guess at which you think is which? So the image on the left was taken with the Canon and the image on the right was taken with the Sony. So overall, the difference in image quality was minor and I'd be very happy with either kit. All right, so another really important feature of any camera system is its high ISO performance. Basically, we wanna know how high the ISO can go before the grain or the noise in the image just becomes unusable. Now, I've done an entire video all about noise because ISO doesn't necessarily equal noise. There's a lot of things going on in regards to how underexposed it is, overexposed. But in today's video, I'm just gonna test both cameras at different ISO levels and just to see how much noise there is and whether one has an advantage over the other. All right, here's an example taken at ISO 1600, um, shot of Oz of the Owl. Both cameras can handle this ISO with no trouble whatsoever. It's even hard to see the noise, it's barely visible. And then if we even bump up the ISO to say even ISO 5000, again, both cameras are very similar. We're starting to see a bit of noise but there's no advantage to either camera at this range. All right, so here's a comparison of a Willy Wagtail taken at 25,600, which is extremely high and one I probably wouldn't use, but we can see that there's a lot of noise and they are very similar. I mean, perhaps the Canon has a slight advantage, but again, it's hard to notice. I did take a shot at ISO 102,400, which is just ridiculous. You'd never use that, but the cameras can go up to that, so why not? I tried that. And just of interest, the you have to shoot in mechanical mode to get that high on the Sony. Um, but we can see here, for some reason, the Sony was actually quite a bit darker, even though we were taken at the same settings. And the Canon did actually have a distinct advantage at this high ISO. I also tried 64,000, which again is really high on this sort of green background and again the Sony was a little bit darker and the Canon had a bit of an advantage. I'd be curious to know why it's darker, maybe someone could let me know in the comments. So overall there wasn't a clear winner when it came to the noise, both cameras performed extremely well and I'd be happy shooting up to ISO 12800 on either. Alright the next thing I tested was the dynamic range, basically all I'm interested in is how overexposed the image can go before I blow the whites because occasionally you might overexpose it and you really wanna be able to recover those whites as much as you can. So what I did is I took some shots of Oz of the Owl that was overcast when I did it, and believe it or not, I was able to go up to two stops and two thirds overexposed and still retain some detail. We started to get a, a few hot spots, 
and the Sony had a slight advantage, but it was minimal. So when the sun was out, I overexposed it by two stops and both were completely blown. So the sunlight, direct sunlight definitely has an impact on how overexposed your image can be. I underexposed both by about three stops and both of them had plenty of detail on the shadows and there was no problem uh, increasing exposure in post. Of course, you're gonna introduce more noise if you underexpose all the time. So both cameras have really good dynamic range and you shouldn't really be over or underexposing your images too badly. But if you do, you'll have a little bit of confidence knowing that you can recover it in post. So the lens speed and max aperture was also deemed to be quite important. I did touch on that previously that the Canon's max is 7.1 and the Tamron is 6.7. So what's the issue with these slow apertures? Well, it really happens when we have low light because we need to get as much light into the camera as possible. If we can't have a higher max aperture, we need to reduce the shutter speed or increase the ISO. If we increase the ISO too much, like in this shot, 25,600, the image just becomes unusable. So I have to reduce the shutter speed. And in this example, I actually had to reduce the shutter speed all the way down to 50th of, 1 50th of a second, which gave me an ISO of 3200, which is usable. And I took a few shots. Now, thankfully, the IBIS on these cameras enables you to use those low shutter speeds and still get sharp shots. And you can see the difference on the screen here. We've got 1 50th of a second and 3200 ISO compared to 500th of a second and 25,000 ISO. Clearly, the one with the lower ISO is the winner. And it's great that you have that ability to shoot at such low shutter speeds. I wouldn't advise it all the time because you're going to get motion blur. If the bird moves, the image is going to be blurry and you're more than likely to get a little bit of motion, camera shake as well. However, it's good to know that if you do have really low light, you can lower that shutter speed and still get nice images. I think a good idea is for you to just go out and test this for yourself so that you know what is your lowest shutter speed you can go to and still get sharp shots. And the other thing with the slower aperture is it also impacts our depth of field and how dissolved or out of focus that background is. So for an example, I shot with the 500 f4 and you can see what a difference there is in the background. So the fast prime at f4 just dissolves that background compared to the 6.7 of the Tamron. Now the primes just in general have a nicer background anyway, but you can see in this example how much nicer the background is with one of those big primes. All right, the next feature that I want to talk about is the FPS and the buffer. Thankfully, Canon's caught up to everyone else, and we finally have a big buffer to allow us to take lots of shots. Both cameras, I think, are rated at about 240 raw photos. That's about 12 seconds at 20 frames per second, which is a lot of photos. But you need to be aware that you have to have the very fastest SD cards to achieve those sort of speeds. So both cameras shoot at 20 frames per second electronic and 12 frames per second and mechanical so the sony has the massive advantage of well, for me anyway of having an audible shutter and electronic mode that you can turn off and on so you can have completely silent or you can have some sort of feedback on the canon there's no option for any audible shutter and it's actually one of my gripes or bugbears because i like to have that feedback and on the sony you can obviously program that to a button and you can turn it off and on whenever you want depending on the type of bird that is in front of you. So I've already mentioned it, but very quickly, both cameras have IBIS, both lenses have stabilization. You put them together, you can take amazing shots at low shutter speeds as I showed earlier. So the Canon works slightly better for video. With video, for whatever reason, I can't get the Tamron to be smooth and fluid. I've tried all the three different um, VC modes on the side of the camera. Basically, it holds it steady, but if you move, it, jutted, it sort of jumps which makes hand-holding video very difficult. And you can sort of, in post, you can just add even more stabilization to make it quite smooth. All right, so the actual electronic viewfinder, surprisingly, they're exactly the same resolution of 3.69 million dots, I think. I would have thought the Sony, at its price point, would have had a far better EVF. I think the A1 has 9 million something. The R5, I think, has close to 6 million. So that is a bit of a letdown of the Sony. Uh, they still work fine. And they're just a, a little bit crunchier or a little bit more digital. When you look through the newer electronic viewfinders, it's a lot more DSR-like. So it would have been a nice thing to have on the Sony. I know the Sony says it's got a blackout-free viewfinder, and it does when you're shooting an electronic, but I don't really notice blackout in the Canon either when shooting an electronic. Perhaps my brain's got used to it, but I don't have any blackout issues whatsoever on either camera. I think it's worth exploring the minimum focus distance a little bit more. So just to show how important it is, I actually heard some bees on a she-oak that was flowering in my front yard and I've 
approach these bees and I was able to get really close as you can see. So the cannon, as I mentioned, was one meter and the Tamron's 1.8. That just means that the bee or the insect or whatever it is, is gonna be a lot bigger in your frame because you can get so close and have 500 millimeters of focal distance. Uh, Focusing is a little bit more of a challenge with the bees moving around and that, but on the Sony, here are the shots that I got of the bees. They look fantastic lots of detail on the bee and it kind of functions as a semi macro lens in a way. The Canon allowed me to get even closer and I somehow fluked this shot of a bee flying and I just wouldn't have been able to get shots like this I don't think on my big prime it's just too heavy. I think the minimum focus distance on that is 3.7 meters and that was the big downside of say the Canon 800 f11 I think the minimum focus distance is six meters so there's a huge difference. These zooms allow you to get really close and gives you a bit of creativity I suppose when it's framing up different subjects. If you've got a tame bird you're going to be able to get really close so that minimum focus distance is a huge benefit of these lenses and especially the Canon. All right I just want to talk quickly about the cameras themselves. As a long-term Canon user I'm very familiar with it. You know my fingers know where to go. I like the menu system. I like the touch screen. I like the Q button that gives you access to all the functions and settings very quickly. Overall, I just find the Canon very easy to use. So as an old person, I struggle with change. And when I got the Sony in my hand for the first time, I must admit I struggled. My fingers didn't quite want to go on the front dial. And when I went into that menu, the dreaded Sony menu, it just took me ages. And I was trying to press and touch the screen to move around the menu. And I couldn't believe it that the menu is not touch screen. I know Sony make phones and have the technology so that was really confusing to me that you had to use the button. When we talk about the Sony body itself this is where it really shines and that's in its customization. It is incredible. You can pretty much customize any button on that camera to do whatever you want and there's lots of buttons all over it. So the control wheel itself is amazing because you've got four buttons there up down left and right and obviously the set button in the middle. You can program those to whatever you want and just those features alone make it amazing. It also has a recall function where you can save all your settings and assign them to a button. So if you had bird and flight, you could have all your bird and flight settings with the focus mode and the um, high shutter speeds and touch of a button. You can then capture something on the Canon. It's a little bit more clumsy and you've only got a few C functions there to record that sort of thing. So overall, the Sony in regards to that is just far superior to the Canon. Another thing I really like on the Sony is just the battery display. It gives you a percentage, whereas on the Canon it's just got like three bars and it's like your fuel tank. It goes from three quarters to nothing really, really quickly. And I'd much prefer to have the Sony percentage so I can see it coming down. And the other difference is the back LCD screen. Obviously on the Canon it's a full flip screen, so it's really good for recording video like this. Um, whereas the Sony is more of a pull out um, up and down sort of thing. It can be really good if you're wanting to shoot things that are down low. So often people don't want to get on the ground and sometimes it's wet. You can just flip out that screen, hold the camera down low to get that different angle without having to lay down. And I have definitely done that. So I've just used the screen on the back to um, you know, do the composition and then take the photo. Ultimately, I was able to use both cameras quite easily to take the photos that I want. I could set them up easily to use in manual mode. I could change the focus. You know, you can do all the basics really well on both cameras. All right, so what's my conclusion? Well, I think the Sony body and the Canon lens are both overpriced for what they are. The Tamron lens and the Canon body offer way better value for money. And I actually think if you paired those two together, that'd obviously be a lot cheaper. I think that would be like just under 4,000 US compared to the Sony and the Canon lens, they'd be over 7,000. I just don't think there's that big of a difference between them to justify that price. Obviously, if I had to choose just one kit, I would go with the Canon system, just purely because the cameras are very, very similar and the Sony doesn't justify that extra $2,000. But the lens, the Canon lens is a little bit better. You know, it's sharper, it's lighter, and overall, I believe you can get better photos with the Canon system, with the auto IAF and that sort of thing. So that would be my reason. I also think it's worth mentioning just how good this Tamron lens performed. It's half the price of the Canon, yet we're able to get very, very similar photos. And I really hope they make this lens for the Canon body. Um, it would work really well for Canon or Nikon. So hopefully that happens in the future. Let me know in the comments what your thoughts are, which system would you go with? Also let me know what I got wrong, what have I missed? Um, you know, obviously I'm not a long time Sony user, so perhaps I've missed a few things. 
All right, so that sort of brings us to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this content, it helps me a lot if you give it a thumbs up just below the video. If you want to see more of these videos, obviously hit that subscribe button. Thanks to the members that make this channel possible and make these videos possible. Thanks to the fairy wren for singing to us. Um, and until the next video, take care and see you later. So ultimately, I was able to, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, both cameras are really good. Uh, but one of them, the one on the, which one's which?